Thank you for that introduction. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, mostly about our work in engineering related to haptics, the uh, science and engineering of uh, the sense of touch. Um, uh, during the talk, I'll touch a little bit on the art stuff at the beginning. Um, if you want to hear more about, uh, see more about what we do, uh, look up our website, retouchlab.com. Uh, so yeah, now I'm at UC Santa Barbara. There was kind of a, uh, uh, a circuitous um, a route to this path uh, and this uh, large section of uh, industry and R&D and interactive arts there, but um, that's culminated in an emphasis on uh, haptics and these days on wearable and soft robotics. So trying to design robotic systems that can reflect some of the um, uh, amazing capabilities, uh, especially dynamically, of um, biological organisms for touch. Uh, but uh, in the arts, I started by um, creating pieces uh, kind of like this one that you see here. This piece called Lita um, is an interactive robotic sculpture um, uh, designed with colleagues in Belgium. This was a commission for the Feno Science Center in Wolfsburg, Germany, this beautiful um, Zaha Hadid designed building. Um, back there. Um, the piece consists of two sections of wall, uh, about uh, two meters high. Uh, you can impress your body on one of them. Uh, the wall will retract where you contact it. A second wall, um, about 20 meters away, reproduces uh, that impression. And so, um, I don't know if I can adjust the lighting here at all, but um, the uh, piece is based around a set of custom, uh, probably not. Oh. Never mind. <laughs> the piece is based around a set of custom taxels. Um, these are uh, individual retractable elements uh, with uh, force sensors. And then this customized uh, pneumatic actuator. Uh, it's a modified McKibben muscle with a um, shape memory alloy valve in one end and a passive leak at the other. It gives it this kind of uh, interesting organic quality. A big uh, microcontroller network uh, uh, controls the whole thing and uh, synchronizes behavior between the two walls of the structure. So it was a, kind of a major undertaking on a budget. Um, later, uh, during my PhD, I worked on other aspects of large surface haptics, um, uh, specifically walking surfaces designed around this kind of um, uh, haptic cell I designed. So it does both force sensing and provides um, accurate uh, um, uh, mechanical feedback to the foot, simulating the sorts of um, responses that you would feel when walking on natural ground surfaces. We also provide touch feedback in interactive applications uh, via an augmented floor surface. I've also done work related to that on sort of trying to design physically motivated um, uh, signatures of ground materials. And um, this, what was interesting is that um, we found through the course of this work that by providing uh, kind of uh, appropriately designed uh, vibration feedback uh, to the foot um, at really low levels while people walked on a rigid surface, we could make the surface dramatically softer than it uh, really was, uh, many times softer in some cases. So uh, and often with levels of uh, vibration feedback that were so low that uh, you could scarcely feel them under normal conditions. So I still have some work on um, uh, rehabilitation of locomotor disorders, uh, trying to exploit um, this work. Um, these days, though, most of the work in my lab is related to a haptic function in the uh, upper limb. So, um, and really uh, motivated by the incredible range of uh, sensory tasks and motor tasks that we're able to uh, perform with the hands. Um, this sort of uh, discriminating a wide variety of materials, um, performing fine uh, dexterous manipulation of uh, tools, and even reading with the fingers. So. Uh, how do we do all this uh, using the skin? Um, well, uh, skin, our, our uh, largest sensory organ, um, covers most of the body and has, uh, has uh, extensive uh, specializations uh, for collecting mechanical information and for using it in uh, interaction and manipulation tasks. Uh, so we have specialized sensory cells that translate mechanical and thermal stimuli into uh, signals in the nervous system. Uh, that are processed in the brain and eventually um, coordinated with motor activity. So typically when we talk about haptics, we're talking about the synthesis of both the uh, sensory system that's um, responsible for translating uh, mechanical signals into signals in the nervous system with uh, motor behavior. So uh, how, uh, how structured movement allows us to collect information about the world and perform interesting um, tasks in it. Uh, so. Uh, 
some of the challenge of understanding these systems, uh, even at a mechanical level, is really well illustrated by, um, by this image. What you're seeing here is kind of what I think of as the simplest uh, haptic stimulus you could experience, a flat glass plate. This is the uh, pad of your finger. Uh, so within this region, we have uh, some thousands of uh, sensory cells collecting information about uh, deformation in this region. And so what's happening here? Uh, well, initially, we have sort of adhesion. The finger starts to slide, and you get this um, relative translation and an inward collapse. Um, you'll see basically, though, um, displacement all through these areas. Each of these represents an individual finger ridge. The um, white dots are pores in the skin, so it's also a self-lubricating surface. And out of all this rich information we'll get from this interaction, you know, we might be distilling a few pieces of information, like oh, this object's starting to slip in my grasp, or um, this is a flat glass surface, so, um, or maybe an embossed surface. So uh, we've been working on a few problems motivated by um, this sort of complexity. Um, one of, in uh, sort of one, one approach we've been looking at um, aims to uh, try to shed light on what I think of as a perceptual constancy problem. And uh, the basic problem is as follows. Uh, if we have some uh, surface we'd like to um, touch, uh, we might want to understand um, what someone feels when they touch that surface. It turns out that um, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, difficult or impossible to deduce what the haptic appearance of that surface would be from the properties of the object. Um, really small changes in contact conditions with those surfaces um, can yield really large changes in mechanical stimuli. Um, nonetheless, uh, I touch a surface twice, uh, one like this, I guess, uh, plasticized uh, surface here. Um, I, so I feel something rather different on my skin each time I touch it, partly due to motor behavior, but partly just due to these variations in contact conditions. But I don't have the impression of touching a different surface each time. So uh, we can think of this as an example of a kind of perceptual constancy problem, uh, maybe texture constancy by analogy with color constancy in vision, where objects seem to have kind of a stable uh, color independent of lighting conditions. And so um, uh, it's a really challenging problem in, um, in sort of uh, its broadest scope. So we've been looking at um, kind of the endpoint uh, forces on the finger and asking to what extent we can relate features of these forces, the resultant force on the finger, when we touch a uh, surface to the properties of the surface itself and maybe how it's being touched. So um, this is kind of a basic question for um, uh, perception, for understanding haptic perception, but also super relevant to things like um, understanding uh, robotic perception or uh, reproducing um, the experience of touching surfaces that might exist digitally but not might not exist um, in the physical world. Um, so uh, as, a, as a way to approach this problem, uh, we designed a, a sensing instrument that could capture um, capture uh, what's felt by the finger, so forces on the end, end of the finger with really good bandwidth across a distributed surface. We uh, fabricate surfaces with known geometry. These are sinusoidal surfaces. We have a kind of large library of these surfaces, uh, different types of these surfaces now, and uh, have people slide their finger across it. We train them to do this um, as uh, consistently as possible. And so uh, you have a very regular surface. The finger moves across it, and what you see is something more like this. Uh, so clearly there's a periodicity that reflects the underlying periodicity of the surface, but you have a lot of other stuff going on. So um, uh, different periods of this interaction look different, and in general they, um, they uh, relate in a more or less complex way to um, the nature of the surface. Where is this uh, recording from? Uh, so we, we designed this custom uh, two-axis load cell to record uh, these forces. Um, and so, uh, so indeed, if you do this over many, many trials, you find actually uh, uh, qualitatively the individual trials look a little bit like what I just showed, but the trial-to-trial -trial variability is extremely large. And in fact, um, basically, uh, this intertrial variability swamps the kind of uh, average behavior between these different trials, um, even if we carefully align the um, individual trials. Um, so, um, well, we get a little more information in the frequency domain. Um, so uh, this is the periodicity of the surface, and then you see these subsequent peaks, which sort of indicate um, that there's an interesting nonlinearity to this interaction. Um, 
So uh, more recently, we've been analyzing this data um, uh, numerically, uh, so by simulating a uh, finger uh, uh, with uh, as much uh, mechanical fidelity as we can uh, manage um, with, and good temporal resolution, we can reproduce qualitative features of these force signatures. Um, so this is in the spatial frequency domain. We've done a Fourier transform in space here. And so the, um, the peaks of this, uh, so the peak frequencies uh, approximately match here. This is a, uh, we've lost a dimension here, and so we, the dominant peak is actually due to the finger ridges. Uh, but most of the intertrial variability is very difficult to reproduce. Here we've uh, tried to capture variations in contact condition by randomizing over initial, initial conditions, but um, sort of an open problem for us to understand this. So uh, we're still trying to approach this um, in our current work. But um, uh, so the account I just gave is a nice prelude. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of to what I'm going to talk about next. So um, a lot of uh, our existing accounts of sort of the production of haptic information during interaction with the hand is really cited close to the location of interaction between the finger and a touched surface. And um, there's a good reason for that. So uh, in mechanics, we have a principle called uh, due to sans venin, um, which says that um, two statically equivalent loads um, uh, give rise to um, uh, similar uh, strain fields or stress fields at uh, large distances. Um, uh, but uh, the key word here is statically. So uh, we know uh, from you know, lots of examples in continuum mechanics that uh, time-varying loads can give rise to propagating signals like the signals uh, through which you are hearing me speak now. And so uh, might these play a role in uh, haptic perception. Um, so to investigate this, we designed another instrument. Uh, this is an accelerometer array worn on the hand. Um, there are 30 sensors in this particular array. Our new one has uh, 50 sensors, 48 uh, to be exact. Uh, each of these is a um, custom sort of uh, uh, package uh, for a, a wide bandwidth uh, commercially available MEMS uh, sensor. So we have about a kilohertz of bandwidth um, on three axes at each sensor. We measure the, uh, so what we do is stimulate the end of the finger and uh, measure the response in time across all these different positions on the hand. And um, so, and we do that when people uh, interact with different parts of the hand, different surfaces, grasp objects, and, and uh, lots of different things like that. Uh, so in each of these trials, we collect um, uh, uh, time varying recordings from all these channels. Um, and what we do next is integrate information between these point measurements um, using a local propagation model that uh, models uh, the local attenuation of these signals from one point to another in order to come up with an integrated map of the, um, of the uh, propagation of mechanical energy in the, at the surface of the skin. Uh, so that yields um, that yields portraits like this. It's kind of uh, so for each um, interaction type or material, we get a different um, pattern here, averaged in time of the uh, of the uh, vibration energy that propagates to different parts of the hand. So um, so as I'll show in a moment, these uh, signals basically propagate as mechanical waves through the hand, and it suggests a really rich palette of uh, propagating mechanical signals that travel away from the distal ends of the fingers where these signals originate. Uh, there are a lot of interesting features to these signals. For example, um, uh, here we have uh, tapping with uh, the uh, index and next and middle finger, uh, light and hard. So these are normalized. And what these portraits suggest is that um, when tapping hard, a preferentially larger amount of the energy is distributed to uh, more proximal areas of the hand away from the region of contact. Can you go back to that instrument that you have on the hand? Yes. Okay, that one. How many, and what do you actually measure? So we're measuring acceleration in physical yeah. unit, acceleration in physical yeah. units, yeah, yeah. meters per second squared. Uh, so and we get the full vector at each location. We're measuring the skin, surface of the skin, so uh, that's it's directly coupled to the surface of the skin. Skin moves. 
That's right. So, so it's an open question as to where, how uh, these mechanical signals that originate with contact at the ends of the fingers propagate to other areas of the hand. Uh, so I, I, left, I left out another slide, which is a short demonstration. So uh, uh, this one you can do yourself. So you take your ri left wrist and place that to your ear, and then take your right hand and oppose your fingers just like this and gently stroke the end of one finger okay. with the other. And so if you do that appropriately, you can hear not only a mechanical signal propagated far up the wrist, but you can hear the periodicity of your own finger ridges. So that tells us that a lot of the sensory information there at the distal end of the finger propagates uh, remotely on the hand. And you could try that same, same experiment with different parts of your hand. A microphone, yeah. With an accelerometer, we get um, physical units rather than... Um, Exactly. So we can see here, these measurements are all for the dorsal surface of the hand. So in, that ex in this experiment, we left the uh, uh, volar surface free so that we didn't interfere with um, hand function. But uh, you can see a lot of uh, individuation among the fingers. Um, every trial is a little bit different. These are averaged over trials. Each line is a different. So each of these is one interaction. This is tapping lightly with the index finger. This, for example, is uh, sliding lightly with digit three, the middle finger, and uh, they each give rise to a different signature. This is averaged over quite a number of trials, uh, but um, they all look a little bit different. This is a power grip. Uh, we have uh, six different subjects in this experiment. Oh, makes a big difference. Yeah, so uh, lots of trials, 5,000 trials in total. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, We asked, we trained them to tap um, with Just prescribed, uh, well, it depended on the, so each of these interactions is a little bit different. This one involves a uh, power grip on a, on a um, glass object, a cylinder. This one involves tapping with a stylus using three fingers. So, uh, yeah, so we, we had to stereotype it a little bit, partly because uh, we didn't want the cables to become a factor here. Um, we showed subsequently we could use these signals to accurately decode what the hand was doing. So we've removed the motor information by high-pass filtering the data, and uh, we showed that the, the signals um, can really accurately decode what it is that the hand is doing. Uh, you can design a classifier to do that with minimal effort. Uh, it's always an interesting question in uh, perception or behavioral studies, like individual differences. Yeah, yeah. So we're investigating the physical mechanism of propagation in current work, but um, my, our current working hypothesis is that these signals propagate as shear waves in the, in the soft tissues of the hand. That's quite possible that, um, so you'd get more more viscosity. <laughs> so, so, um, so we can also resolve these interactions in time, uh, just uh, performing the same uh, action at different snapshots in time. These are recordings from two accelerometers. Um, the results look a little bit like this. So you tap your finger and you get this uh, propagating wave, a really transient wave. So they're they're efficiently damped in the hand, um, but uh, propagate to really wide distances. So um, as you've seen, the signals all the way out here at the wrist are, are pretty high amplitude uh, still. So clearly relevant to... Uh, the the uh, th that's quite interesting. So we see, we see that even, even, for example, if um, one digit, digit, the index finger is tapping, we get a lot of information at neighboring fingers. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Maybe vestigial. Yeah. Um, 
No. You know about it? Yeah, the parchment skin effect? Well, what they did is you put um, a piece of paper and you can see a planet. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it turns out that when they when they they, they grind the surface of the like you know just Rolls Royce, uh-huh. the guys actually put a piece of paper and then they seal it, they put it in the seal. I think it has more um, uh, reflections it's better with the paper than just the bare thing. Mm. And it seems to be something with correlating the signal yeah. across the yeah, 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 yeah. through that. But no one's really explained it adequately and it's kinda of, no one's kind of uh, the mystery. I read somewhere, you know, that there is this cross talk between these three fingers. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It must be related to that. But I'm curious because you might pick up a more um, heightened signal in the paper. Yeah, so it would be interesting to look at. So generally the motivation for a sensor was uh, partly based on the distribution of uh, the sensory cells that are most sensitive to vibration in the skin, the pachinians. So we have a kind of loose network of a couple hundred of these in each in each hand. Um, and, uh, you know, you could think of our accelerometer arrays a approximation to that network and an investigation of what it might um, be um, capturing. Um, So we noticed a a lot of structure to these signals, but a lot of variability in them. And uh, one of the questions we asked was, um, uh, what might be the uh, intrinsic uh, dimensionality of the data? What might be the interesting uh, structure in it? So here we were motivated by um, efficient encoding ideas. They've been really effective at explaining specializations, for example, in the visual system, and um, particularly in explaining visual scenes in terms of um, meaningful parts. So visually, we can think of parts of objects and things like that. So um, uh, we asked if we could identify meaningful parts that encode touch signals. So you can formulate that as an optimization problem. Uh, uh, If you assume that that uh, these individual parts of a touch sensation must be positive, then um, that problem, uh, the linear version of that problem is called uh, non-negative matrix factorization. So our input data looks like this. This is data from individual trials. Um, We have 4,600 of these. Uh, They all look a little bit different. Um, They all involve some interaction with the hands. Uh, We use unlabeled data like this, and then um, uh, apply this um, optimization procedure to them and uh, ask uh, what are the sort of principal components. It's not quite principal components in this uh, uh, NMF procedure, but uh, it's sort of similar. And what emerges from this is automatically a set of meaningful parts uh, that optimally encode these input signals um, that uh, naturally correspond to the uh, sort of functional and anatomical specializations in the hand. In particular, we get one part Per, um, per digit in the hand, and then a few extras. So uh, one of them uh, seems to correspond to just the very distal most part of the index finger, one to this sort of field distributed across the back of the hand, and another here kind of um, involving both of these two fingers um, in sort of ranked in relative importance here. Um, so you can see a little bit uh, about the window that these give on. Let me back up here, see if I can get that to play correctly. So uh, initially we get uh, our input signal, which is this measurement. Is that going to work? Okay, let's try this manually. Um, so our input signal here is, I guess, tapping digits two and three. Ah, go back. Uh, tapping digits two and three. Oh, I know what's going on there. Ungroup. So you see a tap there that spans both of those two. And then if we project onto these individual bases, we get activation in digit one, some activation projected onto this digit two basis, and some activation onto digit three basis. If we combine, uh, I guess, eight of these, we get kind of the uh, the whole thing out of that. So, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so, so um, generally uh, these first six or so are pretty stable. 
7 and 8 uh, change a little bit. Off. Typically, we find one that's uh, kind of a diffuse field like this and one that's concentrated near the uh, distal parts of the fingers. Let's see if I can get this to advance. You show the face. I don't know if you know the, the very last work of Susan Lederman, Lynn Jones uh -huh. from MIT, was showing that you can recognize faces, discriminate faces, by just hands. Interesting. This was very popular because 10 years ago everybody was rushing into visual face recognition, remember? Right. And they were showing that you can do the same with just hands. Excellent. Um, so yeah, uh, actually we performed, uh, in another piece of work we performed the same task I just described, this um, learning task, learning parts, using uh, sparseness constraint. So with a sparse non-negative matrix factorization approach. Again, you can think of this as sort of learning an alphabet of parts or of dictionary elements that um, uh, optimally encode these input signals. Um, you can do this in a couple of different ways, but um, we're interested in um, enforcing sparse weights. That says that basically every, uh, every vibration pattern in the hand should be composed of just a few basic elements. Um, and so if we do that across our database, well, we end up with parts, first of all, that look quite similar to what I described before. Like I said, the first six tend to be pretty stable. Uh, the other two are a little bit more variable. Um, but um, what I'm showing here is a histogram of the weights across all of these trials um, for each of these elements with this sparseness constraint. And so what it shows is that we have a remarkable association between um, interactions with the hand and uh, just a few combinations of weights uh, of uh, bases. So the same bases tend to be um, used uh, for all um, interactions of those types to encode the same gesture. So uh, here with indirect tapping with digits one and two, we get activation in areas involving um, digit one, digit two, and then uh, whatever that is, digit six over here, well, that's a distal area area of digit one that's involved. And that's sort of a precision grip uh, there too. So um, kind of a, a really interesting array of um, uh, kind of insights into what is the information content in these uh, propagating signals. Um, more recently, we've uh, addressed this problem in a kind of time varying way by learning um, time varying bases for encoding these uh, touch elicited vibrations in the hand. Okay, the la last topic I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, is, um, relate, is a little bit more on the engineering side. Um, and we've been thinking about how to design um, electronic systems for sensing and more recently actuation that can mirror um, properties of the skin itself. Um, so, uh, you know, one application of these sorts of devices is um, that we may want to design uh, electronic systems that are not uh, gadgets we hold in our pocket, but that can integrate directly with the skin itself, perhaps um, allowing them to be more richly integrated into our interactions in, you know, at work and home environments and places like that. Um, so uh, this is one piece of work I'm not going to say too much about, uh, definitely uh, work in progress, but um, we've, de uh, uh, we've designed uh, a new technology for um, performing uh, strain sensing and uh, contact sensing and uh, electronic interconnects modeled on a very soft substrate. So I can't say too much about this yet, but uh, a little preview of some of our recent, uh, most recent research. Um, but uh, we've spent considerably more time working on uh, a problem in tactile sensing. And so here, um, uh, the basic question was kind of similar to the one I started with. What is the hand feeling when it touches an object in the world? And uh, so we talked with some uh, physician colleagues, and um, they pointed out to us that there are a lot of cases in which touch is used to diagnose physical ailments. Um, for example, uh, uh, prostate cancer in men. It's a really common procedure. And um, the basic um, uh, 
the basic examination that's used in most cases uh, pr produces no quantitative information today. So we thought, oh, this is an interesting problem. What if we could design a kind of examination glove that captured what it is that the hand feels in order to document uh, the progress of, uh, of different ailments? Um, from a more fundamental standpoint, we're interested in kind of uh, characterizing what the hand feels when it touches objects in different environments. So to address this, we designed a capacitance-based sensing technique. Basically, um, we designed uh, sensors uh, constructed from arrays of channels. We measure the capacitance between channels in these arrays. Um, they look a little bit like uh, this. So um, uh, these, uh, let's see, I think I have a bigger picture here. Yeah. So um, these devices consist of thin membranes. Uh, small as a millimeter in thickness. Um, we embed uh, two arrays of channels on different layers of these devices, um, orthogonal to each other, um, using a casting method, and uh, turn each of these channels into an electrode by injecting them with a metal that remains liquid at room temperature. It's a gallium indium alloy. And terminate those on, uh, on electronics. And um, we're able to use, uh, use these then as uh, tactile sensors, the sensing resolution is basically limited by, um, by the density of channels that we realize and a little bit of the mechanics involved. Um, it turns out that, um, so it was a separate result of the research that um, there's sort of an instability in the electronic signal that results from this configuration. Uh, so there's a nonlinearity in the, um, in the uh, domain of displacement for uh, kind of generic device geometry that leads to a local minimum. So um, that's a big limitation on sensitivity. So we designed this composite device with uh, a new layer of variable aspect ratio structures that allowed us to vary the rate at which, um, at which this part of the structure um, collapses under strain and uh, thereby tune the sensing response. Um, so uh, this required a multi-layer um, lithography approach. Uh, we do this on a soft substrate, so it's a really soft um, polymer material. Uh, otherwise, the fabrication is pretty similar to what I described before with the addition of these micropillar structures. And the uh, and, uh, result is that we can uh, uh, do really sensitive sensing um, across this array with really good spatial resolution, really low crosstalk. Um, this is a cross-shaped stamp. We can do it. Um, uh, in a way that conforms to curved surfaces or um, soft tissues and things like that too. So, uh, so um, uh, in uh, ongoing work, we're using the uh, same devices to um, perform um, uh, imaging of uh, subcutaneous lumps, so simulated tumors. Um, so we design these uh, phantom tumors with, uh, with uh, embedded lumps that are uh, high modulus and uh, press on them. And so eventually the appearance of that lump becomes pretty clear. We can do this also with a bare finger. Um, but it turns out that, oh, I guess I don't have that there. It turns out you can do uh, much better than this if, if you basically, by appropriately conditioning these signals using a background subtraction technique, uh, you can basically make the um, appearance of the tumor independent of the um, indentation that you apply or the embedding depth. So um, we think there's a lot of potential for uh, documenting um, lesions in uh, biological tissues and uh, possibly also really interesting applications in areas like robotic sensing. And we're interested in characterizing human touch as well. Yeah, right. So that has been the dilemma for as long as I know. Yeah. Yeah. No, no question. So we're working on minimizing, but uh, anything you put there is going to guys, you know, impact. Anything you put, any sensor you put on your finger, you are removing your own touch. So, yeah. yeah. 
So uh, one application for some of these techniques, so we're working a lot on uh, actuation at the moment. I'm not going to say too much about that work. It's work in progress. Um, one application that we're working on is uh, to design systems that can uh, uh, electronically amplify the sense of touch, so uh, operate for the hand in the same way that a hearing aid operates for the ear. Could be for people with sensory loss. At, at the moment, we're also looking at interesting applications for people with intact sensations. So uh, uh, examining uh, the finish of Rolls-Royce vehicles could be one. Uh, examining the finish of a, hot, of a luxury vehicle could be one, one application. Um, we're also looking at. The real application is in my generation for the Parkinson people who, who shake hands. Or uh, diabetes is a huge yes. issue, right? So uh, diabetes is so extremely is prevalent. As you reach 80 or so, you know, it's invariable. I feel it myself hmm. occasionally. Sensory, sensory loss in the periphery is really, really common. Yes. The, the nerve fibers are so long that mm -hmm. they, they degrade. And so um, we're looking at new methods for assessing sensory loss, but also uh, I think for the first time um, uh, intervening in that system. Oh, uh, so these are folks in my lab and uh, some of our funders. I uh, want to thank you for your attention. <laughs> Be glad to take any questions. I have to add one little thing. 25 or 30 years ago, I was invited to Stanford as a former alum, as an alumni. And my advisor, John McCarthy, sat in the front row. And I talked about haptics, because Ken and I worked on one of the first hands with Peter Allen. And so this was late 70s, beginning 80s. And John McCarthy said, Rujna, what is haptics? <laughs> Today, I was telling my students, half of the robotics community is working on haptics. So that's the big difference, really. It's, a, it's huge. Even in the short time I've been involved in the field, the awareness of the term has grown dramatically. Yeah. I, yeah. So I have one slide somewhere in which I, I do a Google Scholar search of the term haptics by year. And it starts like this in the late 80s. There are, I don't know, a dozen, a, couple, you know, a few dozen papers. And it rises, rises exponentially. Yeah. So, you know, one of the challenges, um, I talked about this with a lot of uh, your students, but one of the challenges that um, we have in, in haptics these days is that we, we don't have uh, good haptic displays. So getting to the point of investigating, you know, deep computational problems associated with haptics is difficult because there's no standardized display yet, but uh, we're working on it. And it's, it's much more, you know, vision you can collect all kinds of images and, you know, do your beep or not beep, whatever. <laughs> but in haptics, it's really, it's a, it's a motoric control and, and sensing. Okay. Yeah, with the, looking at the medical application of this, so um, you, you showed earlier, creating these gloves that doctors could wear and gathering data when they perform procedures. Do you see you know, in the future um, you know, using that, that quantitative data to maybe get finer grain um, you know, diagnoses or maybe enabling you know, new types of procedures where you could get heightened sensory information? Oh, uh, I guess that's maybe two two interesting scenarios there. So the first is, you know, I think at first we had in mind the possibility of doing things like detecting tumors or, you know, problems in tissues um, with these sensors. But uh, what we've been thinking about more recently is just being able to document a lot of these procedures. Um, you know, right now what happens for men is we go in for a prostate examination, the doctor performs the examination and takes notes, and if, you know, it's uncertain, he'll say come back in six months and compare what he feels now with the notes he took back, or some, you know, very chicken scratch looking sketch. And so um, it's really at odds with kind of modern medicine in a lot of ways. So um, documentation was really the first 
entry point into that for us. But um, yeah, and then uh, we have a kind of broad interest in the moment in the idea of trying to enhance uh, intact touch sensation. Um, I think that's a, an interesting challenge because the sense of touch is so, um, it's so acute already. Uh, so you know, given a flat surface, we can feel a defect that's kind of micrometer in scale. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. So we have work on we have work on the thermal system. It turned out so we've we've been working on um, I didn't show that work here, but we're working on sensory assessment now. So trying to de uh, do early detection of sensory loss. And uh, it turns out that um, the thermal channels and pain channels are affected earlier than the mechanical channels. The reason is because they're uh, unmyelinated. Uh, yeah, so they're, so they're less protect. So these, these thermal channels and pain channels are, are less protected. Uh, they're degraded more quickly by vascular problems and things like that. And so um, we're developing new methods for so probing the thermal system. Uh, I, w I would measure I would measure temperature because uh, temperature is a graded phenomenon and pain tends to be thresholded a little bit higher. So, you know, by the time a stimulus becomes painful, it may need to be quite high in amplitude already. Whereas, you know, so normally we can feel. Not necessarily, but just the thresholds for pain are, you know, necessarily higher. So. Um, but you know the nice thing about pain is you get a clear signal, and so we're working, <laughs> we're working on methods for using non-damaging uh, thermal stimuli to elicit phantom sensations of pain in order to do sensory assessment. That's more or less uh, what that current project is about. Is there a pain without hitting you? Or, or yeah. So there's so there's something called the thermal grill illusion. Have you ever experienced that? Basically, uh, if you have, uh, so I think they have one at the Exploratorium. If you have a set of warm bars and cool bars, and you put your hand across it, you can elicit a burning sensation. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right.